Okay. All right. Hello. Welcome to the 4.30 presentation. You should be in food coma, super tired, or about to get called into work. I'll try to keep this interesting. If not, please let me know. And I'd like the cat calls again. This side of the room matters. Cat calls from this side should just be ignored. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, control system attacks and why rooting a control system is just not enough for you to get complete pwnage or full control of a process. I know that most of you think that pwnage is really the best thing to get. Everyone wants to be admin. But on a control environment, in a control system environment, that's not enough. You actually have to physically control the process or control the physical process itself. So root is just not enough today. Hey, right. my name is Bree Ralston. Um, today I'm presenting to you on uh, some new defensive research I'm doing. It's based on uh, attack concepts presented by Jason Larson. Jason, go ahead and put your hand up. All right, so the group of hecklers over here are ICS attack teams, and I'm the ICS, I'm the token blue hat. So I'm the, the token ICS blue team person, okay? So when I tell you about this research, it means because those guys are gonna go out and do bad things, and then I'm gonna get a phone call later saying, Bree, could you help come clean up? I don't even work with these guys anymore. Why are you calling me? Okay, so I've been in telecom or cybersecurity for 20 years, but I've been doing ICS-specific research for a really, really long time, probably about 15, 16 years. Um, I do tend to be a little bit different from some of our other defensive teams. I am a researcher, which means, uh, okay, shiny object, ooh, okay. I don't, fit, I don't do the day-to-day, 40-hour work thing. This is the, um, the research I'm presenting today is my personal research is what I do in my free time because I got bored with my projects at work and my boss couldn't come up with anything cool enough to keep me on good. Right, so the other thing I've learned as a defender, my introduction to cybersecurity, see this group of people right over here? INL staff, go ahead and raise your hand. I see those, those, two row, those two or three rows right there. My introduction to cybersecurity was with a red team that was told, in all seriousness, my boss told them, it's okay if you hack Bree's workstation. If she can't defend it, she probably needs to learn how. So my work, laptop and desktops, were in a permanent state of pwnage. I learned defense because I, it was you know, self-defense. Uh, so my approach to defense there is very red team focused. So. Just keep that in mind when we're talking today. Um, it also means that depending on the moment, I'm a little bit bipolar about whether I'm blue team or red team, just because I had to stop and think that I'm not supposed to tell my customers, oh my God, that malware was awesome. They totally pimp slapped your system. That's a bad thing to say when you're the blue hat. I'm not supposed to express that kind of coolness factor. Okay, let's see if this is gonna work. I just finished my presentation, so I apologize. Okay, so learning defense as only defensive person on a red team was really, really helpful in a lot of ways when it comes to doing ICS security because we're talking about a space that not a lot of people play in. Strangely, I know, again, contain yourselves, most people really don't enjoy cybersecurity and a smaller percentage of the population of the world enjoys ICS cybersecurity. I know. Brace yourselves for the excitement that's about to come. All right, so what do I do as research? I've already told you I'm a blue hat, I'm a defender. My expertise is in threat intelligence. I really like to know who's doing what and how they're planning attacks so I can anticipate what they're gonna do on my network. I do defensive work because I hate to lose. So I like to be able to try to anticipate as much as possible what the red team guys are gonna do to my networks, how they're gonna do it, and what I can do to make their lives miserable as an attacker. All right, so, and for this presentation, when we're talking about two payloads, normally I would tell you, if I didn't make the rules, no, I don't necessarily have to follow them. That's why I'm security, right? When we talk about defense and cybersecurity in ICS space, 
A successful attack is really about how physics rules. Now, truly, I think that we should have been doing, going with chemistry as the, as the primary thing here, because physics is really not exciting to me. But I'll suck it up and say today, physics rules. Because again, see that three table slot over here? They all like physics better than chemistry. And now I'm stuck with it. All right, so how many people have worked with control systems before, are very familiar with what, they, what it means? Okay, so we have a couple of you, except the three, three table heckling crowd. So a control system for what we're gonna talk about today is specifically those systems used to control the physical process. Okay, these, these endpoints, software, hardware environments, whatever we're looking at, actually control a physical process. They make cameras move, they unlock doors, um, they trigger the fire suppression systems, uh, security cameras. The other thing that's interesting is a telecom uh, generation uh, and or transmission and reception. IoT or SDRs are both also what I would consider telecom um, ICS because it does produce the electromagnetic wave. That's really interesting because the criminal teams are moving into popping the SDRs and forcing them to generate a different type of signal, which means we'll have to defend like we would an ICS, not like we develop, defend a typical cyber system. Okay, so we're gonna talk about chemistry today. My examples are gonna be chemistry-based, not physics-based, just because I could today. Um, how many of you are familiar with phosphorus, elemental phosphorus? Show of hands for those people who've exposed it to oxygen and watched it blow up. Or oh, you guys, come on, that's a pitiful hand raise. If you expose elemental phosphorus to oxygen, you guys like to blow stuff up. Put your hands in the air and be proud. Come on. See the table? See? That whole three tables have did it. So we do have a couple people in here who look like they might be breakers. That's good to know. So I don't know if you all were aware of it, but one of the biggest elemental phosphorus producing plants in the, in the world was up in Pocatello, Idaho. It was shut down and now it's a super fun cleanup site. But when we talk about the damage that can be done with a control system, we're talking about physical damage. The largest elemental phosphorus producing plant in the country is in Pocatello, which is not far from a major fault line in Yellowstone Park. Imagine what happens if there's a mistake with the process or a hacker breaks in, takes control, and exposes the phosphorus to oxygen. We're losing big chunks of southeast Idaho and northern Utah. So today's example of what you don't want to see someone control is an old FMC plant at Pocatello. Okay, so another concept we need to talk about today are the makers versus breakers. Typically speaking, when we're working with ICS, the maker space is gonna be filled with our engineers and operators or technicians. They like to make sure things are working the way they are supposed to. Did, was it designed this way? If it's operating outside of spec, they get kind of uptight, they don't really like it, and are really big with root cause failure analysis. So it doesn't happen again. They clean stuff up as they go. It's part of how they keep their jobs and it's part of how they prevent physical damage from occurring. Breakers, on the other hand, <laughs> tables two, three, and four over here, are kind of a shock to the engineering and tech systems, um, okay, and to the people themselves when they first meet them, because engineers and techs who run a process don't understand why you'd want to break it, okay? That's a fundamental problem, and it's a culture clash that as an attack team I would have to accommodate for, and it's a culture clash that I as a defensive coordinator would also have to accommodate for. These groups do not work well together. They do not play in the sandbox well. Oh my goodness, they really don't play in the sandbox well. So, you'll know a maker because when there's a problem, they immediately go try to figure out what happened and what they can do to prevent it again. Okay, so they built all these fail safes into their systems to make sure that if they saw a problem once or twice, it can't be, uh, it's not a reoccurring problem or it can't be triggered and unexpectedly occur again. Right? They clean up as they go. Breakers, on the other hand, they like to just see what happens. Oh, I was not supposed to push that button. And I know you told me if I press the red button, all the water came down, but I didn't really believe you. Now, 
Again, this is a really, really important concept because when we talk about the two payload problems, especially with the Ukrainian attacks, we can see where they're bringing in teams and how they work together. Right now, those teams are not working together very well. The fact that they're training means when they're ready to go live with a real attack, we probably won't see them coming because they have learned to work out those differences. This particular maker versus breaker space is our biggest actual indicator for when an ICS attack is running. Because a cyber team will play around, someone who doesn't have the engineering experience, will play around in the ICS space if they break it open. So if they get root on an HMI, they don't really know what to do with it. If an engineer is given root on an HMI, they know what to do with it, but they're really not going to push the buttons that break anything. You can see them actually physically pause. I think they start twitching most of the time. You want me to, you want me to what? Why, why do you want me to break it? We, this could really do some damage. Yeah, that's the point. Hey, um, any questions on why makers versus breakers is important? This is, when I tell you this is our single biggest indicator right now for an ICS attack, I fully expect that my security tools will not give me any warning that I've got someone on my ICS network and that they have admin access. I really expect my makers to see the stuff first. What I need to do is make sure that they know to call me and say, hey, we got something kind of suspicious happening. Will you take a look at it and see if it's a cyber attack? My IDS is not going to pick this up, and neither is my, neither are my endpoint detection. It's going to be functional failures. So I need my makers to be at least aware of what breakers can do and why they would do it, even if they don't ever plan on being a breaker themselves. OK, so the other part about getting into an ICS attack is understanding exactly what you have to beat. So with a cyber attack, we, when we think about beating something, we think about beating the technology. Think about beating IDS systems, doing bypass and evasion, making sure our CNC channels are working the way they're supposed to. When you're beating a control or trying to gain control of a process, you have to beat people, you have to beat actual workflow and process, and you have to beat technology. You also have to be able to anticipate the physics. Um, and if you don't know the physics, you're probably not going to be able to control the process thoroughly. Or at least not enough to do a granular control. You'll probably just DOS it and they'll be able to bring it back up. That's not long-term control, not what we're talking about today. So when we talk about makers or ICS teams, you're typically going to see three different, three different types of people. You're going to see the process teams who are typically engineers who make the process run. In this case, this is a distillation process for elemental phosphorus. When a process engineer at, say, our Soda Springs plant, the Monsanto plant in Idaho Falls and Soda Springs, looks at the technology, they look at the control system, they look at the servers, they're not really seeing the technology. They're seeing how this makes their process work. How do they actually take the raw material and get elemental phosphorus into the tanks? They don't really care about the tech. They might know it. They might be able to say some key words, but this is not their focus. They do, however, play a really big, important role in setting up the fail-safes where something happens to the process. Say a hacker breaks in and takes control of it and tries to subvert it, ruin the process quality or the material quality at the end, these are the guys who are going to catch that. They're the ones monitoring whether or not the phosphorus came out the way it was supposed to, if it's meeting our test requirements. So we have to beat these guys and what they're doing for reliability, um, and for quality control, for process operations, so things operate outside of spec. They're going to be taking a look at that. That's one area that we're going to be looking at. The second is the process automation teams. These guys are looking at the very same equipment so the same sensors, the same vibration sensors, same variable frequency drives, but they actually see the process technology and how their tech makes it possible to remove the raw materials through the distillation process, result in liquid phosphorus, and get it into the tanks. But they tend to see these things in terms of endpoints and what should be talking, not network protocol, but what should be happening. Okay, this tank is full, and now we need to pipe it into our our overflow tank, right? They're, so when they look at the tech, they're not looking, it's a Microsoft operating system talking on Modbus TCP or Modbus IP instead of Modbus not IP. They're really looking at it saying, oh, that overflow sensor isn't working right. It's not reporting back, and our operators are ignoring the alarm too often, okay? So these guys are looking at how the, the automation or the technology is facilitating the process flow 
That's a very different approach than an IT admin would take. So what they're looking for to make sure the process is running smoothly and efficiently is something we also have to beat as an attacker. I have to make sure that these guys don't see any indication that I'm running my attack or trying to take control of the system. Okay, and we talk about culture clash between makers and breakers, right? Hackers and engineers working together. The other really, really big and critical culture clash you'll see is between corporate IT teams um, who are working with the control system groups. They look at stuff and say, oh, this Rockwell Stratic switch is actually just a Cisco switch with some Rockwell software on, running on top of it. But it's Cisco under the hood. Why can't I manage it like I manage everything else? They see stuff like in a typical network diagram. That's all they're concerned about. What they don't understand is this particular gear is controlling a physical process. If we lose control of the physical process, it's like parking a running car on top of a hill in San Francisco, keeping it at neutral and walking away. Boy, I hope that doesn't hit anything. I hope it doesn't roll downhill. Uh, I hope that, you know, I don't get sued or put in jail for absolute neglect. So when an IT team is working with an ICS team, and this includes security who'd be helping you detect stuff, they have to understand what the difference is. If I lose control of the physical process, people can die. Environmental damage, physical damage, the company loses millions of dollars. That's not something that IT people typically consider. Uh, so when we're doing security, we don't always look at the indicators the way we should for an ICS or process attack. Right? Indicators have different contexts, therefore they have different meaning. We have to look, as defenders, have to look at it a little bit differently to anticipate what the worst case scenario is going to be. And any questions up to this point? You just feel comfortable with the basics? You're wide awake? Okay. Yeah, it was, I see the gentleman over here in the red shirt and the gray sweatshirt's kind of like, yeah, you know, awake. Okay. So we talked about what we as defenders will have to take a look at. Attackers, this is, this is always fun when I get to work with them the first time. People have worked with control system software before. The first time they look at the common configurations, they're like, oh my God, it's like heaven in here. They don't have lockdowns, there's no ACLs in the firewall, you're not doing any packet filtering. They're like, oh man, I'm going, I'm getting the Pony Award. I want to kill this thing. They actually do kill something. They force reboots. They force the process out of control, I mean, out of, out of spec. But the fail safes for the, the engineering teams, the automation teams are put in place will typically stop them from causing permanent process damage. They just stop it from working momentarily. So granular control of the process, like we saw with Stuxnet, they were able to spoof data that says that the process looked like it was. They actually had a spoof in several different areas. Right? They knew the physics in addition to the cyber. Most cyber people or hackers who come in and look at ICS for the first time, they get really happy and don't realize they have to beat all the safety, reliability, and fail safes baked in by the engineering teams. It's why they get caught. It's why we can expect in the next couple of years as the criminal teams get more interested in ICS targets because they can monetize them fairly easily. I mean, ransomware on my HMI, we're going to pay that, right? We, we have to have the, the HMI working. So most teams are going to pay for that. Criminal teams will learn to monetize, and they are going to learn more about ICS. Our best chance right now of catching them is before they have full control of the process because they didn't know they needed a blended attack team or they didn't know the rules of physics that were going to limit them. All right, so this comes down to why we have two payloads. So from a cyber perspective, um, I'm going to be, I'm going to be referring to it as a payload. For me, there are actually two different workflows. So when an attack team comes into an ICS space, I expect to see two teams um, or two different major projects that the teams have to accomplish. And they're going to have a different toolkit for each one of them. They're going to have a different purpose, different tasks, uh, different timeline, different schedule. Okay, going into it, if I know that, I've got a better chance of detecting it. Again, if I can anticipate what those would be, where they would have to go get their information to learn the process, understand what it's going to take for them to learn to control, how they're going to run their test hits, I've got a better chance of detecting it and making sure my engineering teams are aware. Say, hey, we got something happening that just doesn't look right. We don't have a good process explanation for why it's happening. 
this is where we'll, we'll catch them as they're, as they're learning to process enough to develop their second payload. Okay. That, I gotta ask this. How many people here know about the underpants gnomes? Show of hands. Okay, look, that's half the audience that didn't know. I am not the only one. See, I didn't know about the underwear gnomes from South Park. I mean, really? Okay, now, see, I said South Park, underpants, gnomes, now who knows? Okay. I am not the only person who did not know. So apparently, the underpants gnomes have a very undefined business process. If you collect underwear, you're not going to ask why, um, you do something magical with it, then you make money. We're not sure what that middle stage might be. We're not sure exactly how you'd monetize or what the value would be, but you throw some juju at it, and you make money by collecting other people's underpants for I don't know what reason. Okay, so ICS Ponage. Most cyber teams will go in thinking it's going to be the same kind of thing. And we're going to get root. We're going to go work some cyber magic, and then we're going to blow up the world. Nope, because we have engineers. We have engineers who don't like their process to go wrong. We have engineers who get really, really like, oh, there was one error in a million. That's that whole, I know you're familiar with Six Sigma, mean engineering. Okay. I just want you to know that ICS engineers love that stuff. They like to be able to say, oh, we had a thousand tons of phosphorus go out and we only had like one one hundredth of a percent of, you know, our product had extra chemical. And they get very excited about it. And I think they must get bonuses because they talk about it a lot. And I like the tech, but I don't really want to hear about those metrics. So when a cyber team comes in, that middle area, that number two, where they're like that magic cyber juju, where that happens, again, this is something that they're going to have to solve. This is a problem they have to solve that they want full control of the process. Most teams don't know that going into it, so we can, as they're learning the hard way, that this is what they're going to have to do to develop that second payload, we as defenders have a real opportunity to catch them. In fact, I tell you that I think our ability to catch an attack once they're starting to go live and run their test hits in the ICS environment is probably better than it is um, in the corporate IT space, even with all the tools available in the corporate IT space. Because engineers in a process environment notice every little detail and document everything. We've got a much better shot at watching people come through and learn our space. Okay. So the first time Jason talked about the two payload problem, I was kind of interested in it because I was doing some work on how to characterize attack paths and get better at predicting how attack teams were making their decisions, their strategic decisions, or building their toolkits, how they decided to pivot one way or use one technique to pivot instead of another. The two payload problem was really interesting because the first time I applied it, I did not apply it to a physics into an ICS problem or a physics problem, I applied it to a financial attack, and it really cleaned up my threat analysis. I was, I was like, oh, okay, so maybe he's got something here. Maybe, maybe he was right in this one area. Okay, I'll fess up, he was. We know with a cyber team, the chart that you're seeing right now is the attack life cycle. Um, it's based on, it's how I interpret the uh, Lockheed, Martin, Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain as a defender. Okay, so I know anyone who comes in to take a cyber network is going to have to do some target development work. When they, then when they run their first attack, they're going to have to try to get a foothold on my network, that initial point of entry, and then they're going to have to pivot to the targets of value. They have specific tasks and tools associated with that. Right? So in the maintenance or attack operations stage, they're going to have to have a CNC channel because they have to be able to talk back. Those systems that they compromise have to be able to talk back to them or what's the point in owning them? You can't do anything with them. But when you look at this chart, there is no indication of anything other than they got admin or able to do code execution. Right? And this is a fairly comprehensive chart on what an attacker, attack team would have to do if they owned your corporate network. If they want to do data exfiltration, there's nothing in here that says, huh, I have to make sure that vibration sensor when I'm trying to make the generator rock or blow it up, doesn't trigger and let someone know that they got a problem up front. So most cyber teams are very used to planning this. When they're working with the engineering team, you start to see the handoffs get a little sloppy. Okay, so 
that when you see an ICS attack occur, these tasks, you'll see these happen, but you'll see additions of the engineering stuff and where the engineers have to step in and say, okay, you've gotten root on the HMI, here's what we have to do. You see the change in use, you see the change in focus, and they start making errors. We're gonna see that, that two payload, that's the first indicator that we got a problem or they're learning what the, two pay the second payload should be. Okay, I really like this slide as well. Um, Sergey Bratis from Dartmouth, isn't that ISTS? He was, he was with Dartmouth, right? Okay, so a software, exploit, a software exploitation is unexpected computation, right? When you ran the attack, you exploited the system, something happened that the developers were not expecting and the sysadmins were not expecting. Jason thinks that cyber physical exploitation can be explained as unexpected physics. So if you've got questions, Jason, go ahead and put your hand up. Jason will explain it to you later. We could go into it, but I don't like physics, I like chemistry better. So I'm gonna shunt him, shunt you guys over to him. Cyber physical exploitation is when we've gotten, we've gotten root, we've owned the cyber system, and we've put in place the second payload that controls the physics. And something that engineers were not expecting happened. And they're gonna go crazy with it because they weren't expecting this to happen and nothing in the process indicates that it should be occurring. So, it, as a defender, what does that mean for me? When I think about unexpected physics, I think, okay, if my engineers were not expecting this physical process to run the way it was, I need to be setting up my defenses to, to find when we have unanticipated physical conditions, where there is no, no indicator in actual physics itself, so where the process is running, like how the EM waves are generated. There's no indication that process control software that we've changed something that would say, yeah, okay, let's go ahead and generate, you know, an FM radio signal instead of 802.11. Um, this is an unexpected physical condition. As such, this type of anomaly is a valid indicator for us. So it's a physical indicator of a cyber attack. The ICS space is the only place I know where we can actually cross map physical indicators, safety or reliability indicators, to identify when a cyber team is running, is hitting us. All right, so we have two or three times the data available to us in ICS space to identify a cyber attack. Now, when we talk about an out of control process, what we're really talking about is that there's gonna be physical damage of some sort is gonna occur, right? Because we use the technology controlled physical process. The phosphorus leaks out of the tank. It's not immersed or contained in water. It hits oxygen. It spontaneously combusts, okay? For the EM waves, it generated an FM radio signal instead of the um, 802.11. Okay, the engineers will mostly tell you their equipment broke, the people died, uh, or the plant's gonna lose their freedom to operate, the state's gonna shut them down. What I, as a defender, need to know that the process fail-safes that were baked into that did not work the way they expected, and I'm gonna have to compensate for that. When we do the root cause failure analysis, I'm gonna be looking at what could have triggered this type of process fail-safe to fail out, or fail hard, instead of keeping our process contained. There will be a cyber reason for it. It could be a security event, or it could be a functional failure. Like, I don't know, our antivirus was mistakenly installed in the HMI, and the, uh, it quarantined the, the data files and the Rockwell factory talk. DLLs that were supposed to be working did not. So, AV installed in HMI can actually cause the same kind of interruption, but it's a functional failure, not a security event. The unexpected loss of control of the process was my first indicator that we had a cyber problem now. Okay, physical damage. Okay, let's go back to that. How many people here really get kind of, I think it might be fun to blow stuff up? Show of hands. Hey, come on, you can put them up high. We're at a security conference. Okay, so physical damage is the holy grail of an ICS attack right now, right? So Stuxnet, and that was a beautiful, okay. You know, I had to go on this rant for a moment. The point of entry was beautiful, right? They clearly use Eastern European point of entry. 
you got to love the Russians and their understanding of the, of the Microsoft operating system. And they use a registry better than most of my devs do for a QA and reacquisition. The tilde D framework in the middle was kind of lame, clearly not written by anyone who has any criminal experience because they didn't really care if they got attacked. I mean, that thing was huge. And the, the bypass and evasion was just not creative. Effective, but not very creative, and it was really boring to look at. The payload for Stuxnet was a thing of beauty. Right, so when that payload was developed, that team had a very, very good understanding of exactly how the physical process occurred. Like what they were doing, did they, what the variable frequency drives needed to do, what the sensors needed to do, what the operators were gonna see in their screen, what the engineering designs were supposed to look like and how that influenced the process design, okay? So Stuxnet is the holy grail right now. But as the criminal teams, I think, become more interested in the space and they see more ways to monetize, I think the first energy um, the problems that caused the blackout in 2003, the Northeast blackout in 2003, I think that's actually a better example of what we can expect to see as criminals get into the, the um, ICS game a little bit more thoroughly. They're going to find different ways to monetize. If you're coming in to compete with an established ICS competitor, like say you're an ISP, and I can, I can force all of your uh, infrastructure gear offline temporarily or spike up your traffic so you can't handle it like the Mirai botnet did with the IoT stuff. And if you guys were aware of this, but most teams found that they were infected with the Mirai IoT botnet, not because their systems failed out, but because their bill went from like 6000 a month to 181000 That's what one of my customers had. Okay. If you have that kind of continued service level, like you're having problems with your service level and your customers are coming back to have to get their bill adjusted all the time because you as an ISP or a telecom provider can't detect those kind of surges, they're going to leave you and go find someone else. The Northeast blackout is going to be a subtle, I think we're going to see more along that lines. There was a sudden, subtle cascading effect that impacted millions of people. I think there were seven or eight different states. How many states? New York, Pennsylvania, Ohio. I mean, seven states in the Northeast lost power because of a software bug caused by a series of cascading failures. If I, as an attacker, can mimic that, it's going to be pretty hard for someone else to find out what's going on. I also have much better control because it's a small series of cascading steps that affected that. If I can control each step, as soon as someone else pays up, right, they shut down the first loop, we lose power to 500,000 people, company doesn't pay up, when you lose power to a million people, they're going to start paying attention because they're losing money. This is what I think the next round of attacks are going to look like. Okay. Now, the major difference is when we're talking about that second payload. When you're building the second payload, you have to be able to bypass the fail-safes from the process teams, the process automation teams, the IT teams, and the ICS security people. And you have to understand the physics. That's a lot more work. This about quadruples your workload if you're running an attack in the space. Okay? You're going to spend four or five times the resources, just trying to understand what the process does and how it needs to be fully controlled to get that subtle effect, not just a temporary DOS that when they reboot and bring it back online, or bring the plant back up, they're still functioning. If you want Stuxnet, you're going to spend the time and money doing it. Okay, the cyber payload. We can talk about the Stuxnet malware all day long. And it was beautiful, right? I just told you. I thought the point of entry attacks, although I do have a bias, I have a preference for those Eastern European Attacks are always a lot more interesting. Um, cyber was not, cyber, the cyber damage was not the real problem with Stuxnet. The real problem was the, the fact that we forced, or whoever attacked it, I shouldn't say we because I'm a defender, um, forced the physical gear out of specification, right? The engineers couldn't tell what was causing it because they'd spoofed uh, the data and it looked like everything was operating the way it should. They had a huge surge in the number of um, equipment failures. And again, the engineers freak out about those little statistics, right? They don't like one in a hundred million problems with their chemistry, losing equipment the way they were. You know, I think they, um, can't remember the specifics, I had to look that up. But the amount of equipment they lost in a single year was way more than they had at any point prior to that. So the damage occurred 
because they were able to get granular control of the physical process and the way that process was running. Okay, the, loading, the pay, loading the Stuxnet malware didn't do anything. Right, if you weren't running those drives, you weren't running that specific combination of technology, nothing happened on your network. You got infected with Stuxnet. Nothing happened. It, that was not a big deal. Control the process was, which means this two payload problem is something we have to be more aware of. Cyber was just a tool. The real damage came from that second payload. We as cyber people tend to think that cyber is a primary payload because it's, you know, it's malware and it's cool. But that's not what we have to be looking at from an ICS perspective. We have to understand more what the engineers are worried about and how they would find these problems if we expect to fix them. Our interests, our needs, and what we're doing, the tools we're using, those are secondary. Right? We're just supporting actors. When we're doing ICS incident management, the engineers are going to be running the show. As an ICS and cyber person, that's sometimes hard for us to understand. We have to do a little bit more um, adjustment to our detection approach when we do this. The other thing to know about is the blended teams. You will never see an ICS attack run without makers, the engineers and techs, working with hackers. And if that team hasn't worked together for quite a while, you're going to see the blips and the handoff because they're going to be fussing and fighting amongst themselves trying to figure out why they need to do something or trying to understand what the other person was telling them, right? Because makers are speaking German and the breakers are speaking Spanish. This is not happening. We're going to see the miscommunications. We're going to see the failed handoffs. That's where we can step in and do something. It's also a pretty clear indicator of why we need to start looking at the, the two payload problem and considering them separately when we're analyzing in, uh, ICS attacks. If we don't do that, we will not be able to under, understand and anticipate what the criminal and nation state teams are capable of doing to us. Right? So if we don't consider those separately, I'm going to keep looking at it like it's a criminal cyber team attacking a bank, not how they're going to blow up or control something uh, in a physical space. Okay, so do you guys have any questions right now about why that second payload is such an interesting concept and why it will change the way we look at defense? Oh, you guys, come on. You're killing me here. I mean, barely get you to raise your hand and no one has questions, except the, the squad of hecklers over here. If there are no legitimate questions, you're opening me up for, look, I hope you all feel guilty. Yes? Thank you, Brian. So go ahead and repeat that, Craig. Um, so in an actual attack against, like say the Ukrainian power grid attacks, they had a combined squad. They had engineers working with cyber teams. The cyber guys got them on and then the engineers had to try to fly around this process that you could see where the cyber guys were just pushing buttons trying to make something happen, like make the distribution stuff occur, but until the engineers got in and said, okay, this is how you can actually shut down distribution, the cyber teams wouldn't have known what they were doing. And if you look at an HMI screen, most people don't know what the alarms mean and how it had to be bypassed, so you'd have to have both. Um, I've been looking at attack teams that have capabilities where one cyber person or one engineer has both the breaking and making skills necessary. Right now, I tell you that I don't think that of the tier one hackers I'm aware of, not more than one or two could have actually do, done that. So one or two people say, I don't know them all, that your 20 people worldwide have but the physics and engineering understanding necessary to implement the second payload without the help of an engineering team. So that, that kind of long shot odds means they'll, they'll have engineers and technicians um, as well as cyber teams. Okay, so one of the things I did find interesting, when we take a look at the SWIFT banking attacks, that was my, I thought that was an awesome example of the two payload problem and why uh, it has greater applicability for my defensive analysis outside, because the SWIFT banking attacks weren't a problem again. When the malware got loaded, no one cared. The real damage occurred when they were able to figure out what the interbanking transfer process looked like and move millions of dollars into an account get the money out of that second account or the recipient account, 
before anyone could detect it and reverse the transaction. That's a clear indicator that someone knew the money system, right? Someone knew how the financial interbank process works. I don't know about you guys, but I went out and looked up just after that, just did some random searches on how those interbank transfers or the SWIFT transfers actually work. There's very little available. And I am fairly sure that when you do Google searches from a random computer, that they're probably flagging that too. Just saying, that's something to consider. I thought about that after the fact, so just learn from my mistakes. Um, but when I looked at that SWIFT attack, what I would do to detect the malware that was used to get them to access so they could learn the particular um, environment that they were working in, that's an entirely different toolkit and different team or a different set of tasks that they had to do. What I would have had to look for to see if they were doing an tr interbank transfer that wasn't really legitimate was an entirely different set of indicators and it was all people and financial process. I wouldn't have used any cyber indicators at all. I would have been looking at the, like say the SAP systems on an ERP if the same kind of attack were run against my company. I'd have to look in SAP and see how the financial transactions are actually instantiated, approved, and then finalized. I wouldn't use cyber at all. So the two payload problems really, or the two payload detection and strategy is really looking to show some promise on how we can get a better idea of how to handle attacks in the future when cyber is not the critical piece, right? When they're not just trying to infect us and lock us out with ransomware. So, okay, again, the excitement from the audience today is thrilling, please. If there are no questions, that's great. Okay, this is another heckler, guys. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so could you, would considering the second payload uh, help us identify when like a, an insider attack as well as an attack from outside? I think it would, because what you're really looking at is critical impact or critical damage. And critical damage, regardless of where, what triggered it, is critical damage. What we can do then is reverse back off the damage process and say, okay, here's how it could occur with the physics and the automation pieces. Here's how it could occur. The process just went wrong, say if we introduced like impure materials. Or, wow, here's all the automation technology that was used. If these pieces in a technical chain were, were hacked and someone knew how to control it, could we achieve critical damage? For a power company, I have five targets that I'm looking at if I really want to take a transmission or an energy management system offline. I'm going to look at the energy management system itself. I'm going to look at the ICCP connections. I'm going to look at the engineering workstation. I'm going to look at the HMIs and the ICCP servers probably as well. If I take any one of those, I can either knock out power or ensure that we can't transmit or transmit the power the way we need to and destabilize the power cycles. And so those are my top five targets. That's where I'm going to spend most of my time looking. We can do the same thing with, say, the phosphorus plants because we know what critical damage is and we know where those are most likely to occur based on historical incidents. Uh, fun historical functional failures would tell us what to go look for. So most of your hackers are going to go take a look at publicly known incidents at what worst case scenario is for their particular target. So like at a paper mill, you're having a paper dust running around, you blow up a plant. Ogden has the single largest Huggies plant in the country. Uh, they do most of the North American and South American production for Kimberly Clark. If you took that plant out, because you happen to work for Pampers instead of Huggies, you cause a lot of problems for Kimberly Clark, and you're, like, you're economically damaging them in a very significant manner. The only thing you have to do is ignite the paper dust. That's, I think that's what we can expect to see in the future with these attacks. Any other questions? No, I don't. Because again, you can get root on the HMI, but you have to understand what the process is doing. And when you make a change to the process, does it trip an indicator, right? Like if you shut down the, the 
the data stream back to the historian, we would know that the data is not logging. Or if you change up the data and don't know where it all where all it propagates or who all sees it, could you prevent someone from you know someone's le more likely to see the fact? So you have to know where all the data goes. Um, so no, I don't. I think that understanding what, and being able to separate the difference that cyber is just a tool, and the second payload is really where the damage is going to happen. I think that's going to become more and more important and more and more difficult to do as we see teams um, specialize. Like I just read an article where they have. Uh, an underground uh, black hat team has got a cyber team that's hired financial and economic specialists so they can play the market, right? So if you get access to the S&P um, infrastructure and you've got a, an economist or a financial analyst who can look at that data, does the um, convergence of uh, ICS networks into more mainstream um, affect the ease of developing the second payload or not. I think the second payload is always going to be the harder problem. The cyber is just going to be easier to get done. But we'll see the teams get specialized. Like I said, hire a financial analyst or an economic researcher and get them access, SEC, I mean, S&P data access. Come on now, you can't, they've got to be making a fortune with that. Yes. Okay, so I have a couple of things I have to go into when I'm working with new teams. And I just started a new job a little under a year ago, and the um, first team I worked with didn't even want me on site. Like, they really did not even want me there. So going in and saying, and being up front saying, look, I'm the, I'm the trifecta of evil. I'm corporate, I'm IT, and I'm cybersecurity. And I straight up went into it with that and came, into the door, came in the door with, I think I had six dozen cookies and like, uh, I don't know, it, made, it took me four trips to bring all the soda in. So I'm figuring, you know, geeks like sugar and caffeine. This is a preemptive bribe, right? I know IT has done you wrong. I'm willing to listen. I'm sorry. So that's, just going with that attitude um, helps a lot, making sure that you have sugar and caffeine so they actually stop by to talk to you. That's been really eff more effective than I would have thought, right? So for 10 bucks, they'll stop by my office if only to take some cookies. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I don't know any engineers who won't stop by and get that free food. And they're highly sp suspect to me if they don't, right? I'm looking at them thinking, there's something not right about you. Are you in marketing or communications? Those people avoid the free food. Geek teams don't typically do that. So um, going in and recognizing that there's very big differences in the use case for technology. You know, IT, you know, we're making it more efficient to make real-time business decisions. The Microsoft operating system and um, assortment of applications loaded on an HMI are being used to control physical process that could actually kill someone. Not treating them like they're being drama queens when they're saying it's really important that those things are available. We have to understand the use case and be able to, to interpret that and share that. As a security person uh, in ICS space, my job is not really to secure things, it's to make the process run more effectively, to make it more resilient. So the majority of my time is actually spent doing ICS to IT geek translation, okay, and making sure things are administered cleanly. Because if I can't, if the systems aren't administered cleanly, I can't secure them, right? Because I can't tell what the difference is. Was it did the process just stop working because the antivirus didn't work correctly? Or because they installed a GDI patch that interrupted the rendering on the HMI application? Or is this actually an attack? Because the engineering teams are going to be the ones who tell us most of the time that we've got a problem, we need that environment to be as clean as possible so we can eliminate we shot ourselves in the foot as a real problem. But just coming to the table and being willing to listen, that's a really big deal. And then not saying no all the time. Um, before we had a lot of security tools or the ability to automate or people didn't really understand that security is a problem. IT and IT security ended up being the security Nazi. That's no longer a realistic customer relationship model. Um, if I had to make the process more resilient, I had to understand what it's doing, what they need to be able to do, what technology they, they're using to solve those problems. 
and then I can begin securing. But if I don't understand those three things first, I can't do it well, and they're not going to work with me. So, but the sugar and caffeine bribes, I'm telling you, those work really, really well. I just went ahead and I printed up a whole bunch of signs, too, big poster size, that I take with me when I go out to sites. Hi, I'm the trifecta of evil. I have bribes. And I post, wherever, whatever temporary location I'm in, I actually post that. And they're really big and gaudy, so they can't miss it. But I put the cookies and the sugar right next to my desk, so they can't come in and just sneak them out without talking to me. Just in case you're worried about how to do that effectively, I've got a whole bunch of things I've learned about how sneaky engineers are about getting food and not trying to talk to the evil person from IT. Any other questions? Okay, see this is where it starts getting exciting. So his question was, how do we begin to um, defend against the second payload? Um, so we talked, Jason talked to me about the second payload problem, I think in two, January 2016 at uh, S4 by 16. Uh, and I talked to the OSI soft team who were doing some interesting use of the bow tie analysis to anticipate stuff. If I start looking at functional failures or historic events, on the, or with the physical process, I can actually walk back and look at commonalities. Say, oh, okay, these things happen nine times out of ten because this gidget didn't work, or we didn't send data at the right time, or we lost power, or something. Right? There's, there's a lot of commonalities. If I can identify and associate the cyber resources that can make the same failure happen, that's what I have to defend. So. I'll go through and start looking at what's the worst case scenario. What do my engineers and business people told me are critical impact for their process? And what, what are the historical failures you've had? What are the historical incidents you've had with this? Once we get that, we can go back and identify the cyber resources and prioritize where we need to do our security work. That's been very successful. I've now done it at three different companies. Um, and we, the best part about it was not that we just, we minimized our attack surface exposure and got better visibility, but we saw a great deal more um, improvement of the process because I was cleaning up administrative problems as well. Hybrid management. So we were able to say, we got the twofer, right? Help make your process more resilient and made it more effective and we can see attacks coming. So if we start with worst case scenarios, the engineering teams know what those are. We can identify from there and limit. Okay. So the question was, do I consider the cyber kill chain uh, to be similar to that of the site? Okay, so explain the question one more time. Yeah. Okay, so what um, is there a kill chain for the development of a second payload or the second or the physics payload? I think there is, right? So they're going to do design, they're going to do implementation, they're going to do maintenance, they're going to do end of life. There's a different set of tools for that. If you're designing a second payload, you have to know how the process works, and you have to know what critical impact looks like. So they're going to go to the safety and training records. So I just went back through and looked at some of our safety and training records and was like, oh my god. I was able to pull out, um, based on their safety lessons, what critical impact was before the team told me. So that would be design time. I know that I need to flag those particular systems. So if I were trying to mitigate the SWIFT attacks, for example, I don't want to put flags on all the data that trains you on how to actually run the SWIFT software and what the user application, I mean, what the user access controls were. But that training data and that process space, the safety data, is critical. Um, the ladder logic data, like the engineering design data is really valuable if you know how to interpret it or if you've got an engineer who can explain it to you. But there's a set, there's a set um, number of targets they would have to go to to prep the data for da and get data acquisition. If they're going to acquire the data off my servers, we know kind of how they're going to do that. And I can, I can track the data with regular DLP tools. 
but implementation, how they get point of entry, how they get point of entry into the financial process. Did they take over someone's user account or do they, like with the uh, business executive compromises, they send a false email, that's, that's their entry into the financial transaction. So yes, it does mirror it, we just have to kind of step back and look at it a little bit weirdly. Okay, um, I don't know if that's a liberal arts kind of thing, but I'm just gonna go ahead and tell you now that when I talk to the other cyber people, they don't really see it that way. I, I see the similarities. So design, implementation, maintenance, and end of life, those are the same across the board when you're planning either the cyber or the physics payloads. And the same concepts. So if we can study enough of them, we should be able to anticipate. But yeah, so all right. So the the comment was that do most people who really like technology, like if you like to rip malware apart, do you really want to go talk to the engineering teams and do business impact analysis? No, that's kind of a big difference in personality, just like the makers versus breakers thing is. Um, but why wouldn't we then run a blended team if we know that the two payloads are a problem? and that we need one team to really look at the bits and bytes and the heavy duty technical, why then wouldn't we have a security person who likes to play? Like say we're a major bank, why wouldn't we want to have a security person who likes to look at cyber fraud or accounting practices? Um, I mean, I've been telling you that these guys are the hecklers. I tell you that for the team, I tend to like more of the people and the workflow stuff more. I don't really actually like to reverse engineer anything and I hate coding. So. I tend, to, I tend to fill that role when I'm working with them. So it is, it is a different skill set, but if the attack teams are running a blended team, why wouldn't our defensive team be blended? It's just unfortunate that sometimes you have to talk to legal people, and I think, okay, are there any lawyers in the room? Okay, God knows no one, I'm highly suspicious of any deeply geeky person who wants to talk to lawyers. And when you run an incident, you always have to talk to them. At that point, I, just don't, I had to find someone else to do it because I don't want to. Right. So Barry's comment, because he's a chemi, um, is that when the ICS teams, the engineering teams, are doing their process risk analysis, which they do up front, especially when they're designing new process or new plants, they always do these process risk analysis up front, because they know they have all this historical data about what goes wrong. If they include a cyber person in there, we can start getting ahead at the design time. Um, I tell you that, conversely, if we had an incident, as a cyber person, I'm starting to think that I don't want a cyber person to run incident, to coordinate the incident management or response process. I want a non-technical person to do it, and then the cyber person is just the technical SME and support, whereas in the past, the cyber people have run the incidents. I don't think that's going to be a sustainable model long term, unless you're with a small shop, but for big teams, I don't think you'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, so I don't know if you all heard that, the NIMS process, which focuses more on incident response holistically um, instead of just the technical, is incorporating that more, again, holistic approach that includes people who can communicate, uh, who can document, and who can do the business analysis. I haven't looked at the NIMS stuff, so I'll have to take a look at it. Any other questions? All right, well, thank, thank you for your time. If you've got any questions afterwards, I'll be here in the room for a little bit, cleaning up, and I'll be here tomorrow. So thank you for your time, and thank you for your patience. <laughs>